we've cut down a third of our forests. Of the remaining forests, over 80% have been affected by us in a negative way. We are in the sixth mass extinction of the world right now. And one of the main contributors to that is, is cutting down of old growth forests. My love of the forest came from growing up in interior wet belt forests. They're full of huge old trees, thousands of years old. And there's so many plants and owls and birds and animals. It was just a wonderful place to grow up. My name is Suzanne Samard. I'm a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia. Forests cover over half of the terrestrial part of the world. Um, so they have a massive impact on people who live in those forests. If we think about, you know, more ecologically what they do for us, for one, they photosynthesize. So they're the biggest photosynthetic creatures on land. And it, photosynthesis not only takes up CO2 and turns it into sugars and wood and roots and fuels the soil food web, but it emits oxygen in the process. So the very air that we breathe comes from the forest. The other thing about forests is that they're homes to so many creatures. In fact, about 80% of species on the land base on Earth come from and live in forests. Also importantly is a lot of our fresh water comes from forests or they originate in forest environments. In Canada, about 80% of our fresh water actually originates from forests. It's really important for us to protect old growth forests now, especially because we have lost so many, we've affected so many. We've cut down a third of our forests in the last millennia. And so that means there's not that much old growth forest left. And an old growth forest is an old forest that has not been cut down for industrial purposes. In British Columbia, where I live, uh, an old growth forest in coastal regions it has to be at least 250 years old. In the interior regions it has to be at least 150 years old. With that age comes a lot of high functioning nutrient cycling, carbon cycling, water cycling, you know, and the way that these forests are able to cycle these biogeochemicals <laughs> is, is through all the species diversity that's associated with the immense diverse structure in an old growth forest. That structure comes from having big old trees, um, which are homes to thousands of species of lichens and mosses, bacteria, um, birds, all kinds of animals that live in and on these trees. Old growth forests contain the biggest carbon pools in the world on land, and they store a very large amount of the remaining carbon that's in, in the soil and in our intact ecosystems. If we were to cut down the remaining old growth forests, the losses would be immeasurable. We would pulse so much CO2 back to the atmosphere that it would swamp out any fossil fuel emissions from humans. So this complex forest then, when you walk in, you'll notice that it's multi-layered. Many species growing together in all these different layers. You have regeneration coming up under the old trees. There's big old logs on the ground. There's light coming through. There's sun flex. There's shady areas. There's plant species that only grow in these old places. Now, if you walk from that old forest into a plantation, you'll notice huge changes. There's a huge difference. For one, um, they're a lot hotter because there's not as much light being shaded by the overstory. Um, the soil is drier because there, there's not as much water being held by the mosses and the lichens and so on. Um, the forest floor isn't as spongy because you don't have as much organic material in the forest floor. There aren't old logs and the trees in a plantation are all usually all the same species and they're usually spaced quite evenly apart. You, you don't have gaps, you don't have light filtering in in different ways. You basically have a wheat field, but it's made of trees. So vastly different. And what we're finding in our forests of British Columbia, that the plantations that we allow to grow to maybe 50 or 60 years old on the coast, or maybe 100 years on in the interior before we cut them down again, they never get to be an old forest again. You know, and they're functioning by our measurements at about a quarter of the capacity of an old growth forest. 
The world's forests are really suffering right now. And they're suffering because of our abuse on the forest for not treating them well. Um, they're suffering under global change, loss of biodiversity, um, drought stress. A lot of the forests, including in Canada, have become net sources for carbon dioxide now instead of sinks. This is because of fire, land use change, and just, you know, droughts and changing climate patterns and weather patterns that are stressing forests. When we look at the state of the forest around the world, we know that we've lost over one third of forests over the last thousand years. Um, we also know that over 80% of the remaining forests that we have today are affected in a lot of ways negatively by human beings. There are solutions. One of those things <laughs> is to you know, stop cutting our old growth forests. And I'll extend that to say not just old growth forests, which are, you know, have to be a certain age, but any primary forest that, that has not been cut by humans before or clear cut by humans before, because they contain these essential stores of carbon and biodiversity that, that are undisrupted for the most part. The second thing to do when we do harvest forests, we should be looking at second growth forests, well, so forests that are already you know, been affected, maybe it had some losses. We, when we harvest from those forests, to do it very carefully. The third thing is, is to restore damaged forests. So forests that have lost soil, lost biodiversity, maybe they've been turned into a parking lot or a, you know, or an industrial field, is to go into those places that once were forests. Restore the soil, restore the tree, you know, bring trees, plant them, bring seed in, and just restore those places. And I guess the last thing I would say is that of course people have to be healthy, their cultures have to be healthy, their societies have to be healthy in order to do this. And so the fourth and probably one of the most important things, in order to do this, we need social equity. How do we create social equity? Well, we really need to look at our economic system, you know, and revamp it because this capitalistic, revering individual wealth at the cost of other people, it just is not working. It's not a healthy way to have a society. If we can do all this, restoring degraded land, managing second growth forests, leaving our primary and old growth forests intact, what scientists think is that we can actually mitigate climate change by almost 40%. Lastly, I just want to talk about worldview. This underlies the solutions that I just talked about. You know, in the last 500 years we've had this worldview that that forests and nature are there for our taking, um, that we can exploit them and not give back. That is a very unhealthy and unsustainable worldview. What we need to do is get back to our roots, where we came from, where we lived in and with nature, we're part of nature, that we have a, a, a caring relationship with the forest, that we, we never take more than we need, that we give back and care for the forest, um, that we're all connected together, that we're all one together, not separate. What gives me hope are my kids, my students, the next generations, they're so creative and ingenious. You know, they're like the forest. The forest bounces back, right? It regenerates, it creates new space for itself. So do our kids. I really feel that when I look and teach kids and hang around with my, my own children that I have complete faith that we're going to figure our way out of this. The theme for the next International Day of Forests needs to be saving our primary forests, and that includes our old growth forests as well.